Welcome back to another lecture reading. My name is Melinda Cole Klein. In the last two decades of the 19th century, the West grew in population. By 1890, the American population was more urbanized as 40% lived in cities. The incoming people to the West adapted behaviors and traditions in reaction to local conditions. Thus, they created unique communities and joined the expansionist movement promised in the 1840s with Manifest Destiny. In making use of natural resources of the West, gaps between East and West were narrower with the coming of the Transcontinental Railroad by 1869. By the turn of the century, the uniqueness of a Wild West was somehow lost in a national memory as the West was made. The West changed as capitalism and industry made their way across the plains in a fashion that was often violent, lawless, and corrupt. The West could be remembered in a romantic light and would be by artists, writers, and by filmmakers for generations to come. My lecture today is the making of the American West. Historical categories that I have included are as follows. The American cattle industry shifts in the American diet, two prominent Western subcultures, three family economies of the West, and this is followed by a theme that I've titled the lawless West that includes uh, settler violence condoned under the right five conditions. Mining in the West, urbanization of the West and the coming of cities, along with a disappearing West prompts conservation. And at the end of this lecture reading is a romanticized West remembered. The Western fur trade in beaver and buffalo was an extension of a much older pattern of trade that began in southern Canada and New England. The killing of wild animals for their furs was seen by white settlers and Native Americans in two distinct views. White trappers saw their commercial value. The goal was to trap and kill as many as possible with no regard for the species because the Christian Bible taught Europeans the world's resources had been put on earth by God for their use. Native American tribes hunted in seasons to suit their needs for living with respect given to not overhunt or disrupt the pattern of their existence. For Native Americans, animal products meant much to them in their daily use and in their spiritual ideals. To white trappers, their value was in exchange. Under the right conditions, cattle, horses, and sheep emerged as animals of enterprise, grown by whites and to be sold as a commodity, and easily stolen by Native Americans to be used or given as gifts. For the West to be suitable for white settlers, the wholesale slaughter of the buffalo was inevitable. With their absence, this opened up the plains for cattle and sheep ranchers that would more efficiently provide food, clothing, and energy for humans while turning profits. Americans have not always been eaters of beef but by the end of the 19th century, there was a great demand for it. 
If the American diet had stuck to chicken, pork, or seafood, the making of the American West might have turned out quite differently. After the Civil War, American tastes preferred beef and wanted more of it. Beef represented a higher status food, as it does today. The financially challenged eat hamburger, while the middle class and elite eat steak. This symbolism of wealth and the rugged American character ran deep. The open ranges of the Plains states represented a commercial venture to benefit a growing and hungry nation. Eastern consumers hungry for beef did not want the range-fed grassland beef driven to market by cowboys on cattle drives, as it tended to be tough and stringy. Elite consumers desired the corn-fed fatter beef found in the Midwestern states. In the promotion of stock raising in the West, the quality of beef seemed a major obstacle as well as price. For beef to be cheap, it needed to be mass produced. This could not happen until it could be preserved from the 1880s with the invention of the refrigerated boxcar. By the 1880s, the Chicago packing houses dominated the American marketplace. Chicago became the meat and beef capital of America. Packing houses quickly monopolized the market with their industrial slaughterhouses. By the early 20th century, these packing houses supplied the nation with 82% of its beef, all coming out of Chicago. I'd like you to think about the following three points that I'd like to share with you in this regard. Number one, American Sunday dinners seemed to become standard fare that included roast beef, potatoes, peas, and apple pie. For Anglo-Americans, Irish Americans, and those of German descent, beef represented the good life. Principle number two, as pigs lost their pioneering role in the making of the West, it was the processing of pigs in Chicago slaughterhouses that lay the foundation of the processing of cattle into beef products. And principle number three, meatpacking factories became year-round operations. With the coming of the railroad transportation and refrigeration, the future of the cattle industry became a reality. When thinking about the American settler who partook in the making of the West, this family story is at the core of America's history. Many kinds of families came out West, while the West was not, after all, an empty place. Western migrants came for a variety of reasons. They would pursue a range of livelihoods from vigilante to saloon keeper to merchant trader, cattleman, prostitute to farmer. Frontier families and their interaction with each other made life filled with conflict, commercialism, and conquest of the West. It was the family cultures of the westward migrating European Americans that would win the making of the West. This population would make the greatest changes to this distinct geography. Three family styles settled the West. Number one would be patrimonial. Number two would be proletarian. And number three would be entrepreneurial. American families are heirs to what has been termed the Western European family system. 
central to the survival of the traditional family was the system of patrimony. Typically, it depended on factors associated with private property accumulated over generations as a source of wealth. This is, was, a common family type. For it to continue, the household would have to make enough money not only to support the current family, but would continue through inheritance to children and grandchildren that hopefully would follow. It was through this family type a young adult gained enough knowledge and skill to pursue independence. A son grows and learns to be a farmer like his father. Father dies and leaves him the family farm. A second son either moves west to pursue farming or another line of work after sufficient schooling as an entrepreneur. If the first son or other inheritor dies, he would be next to inherit the property wealth left to a relative or other sibling. The proletarian is a wage earner. This person, urban or rural, lacks access to land ownership or has not pursued training to obtain skills to work a farm or a trade. He moves from place to place. If left unchecked, he is likely to spend his entire adult life as an unskilled worker. And in this type of household, it becomes necessary for generations of family members to live together in efforts to pool their monetary resources in order to survive. They rarely become property owners and remain at the subsistence level living paycheck to paycheck. At the top and middle segments of the American economic spectrum is the entrepreneurial family. This family style is less concerned with waiting or expecting to receive monies or inherited land or other forms of wealth. Instead, this family type survives because the head of household had pursued an educational path, whether formal or informal for that matter, to become one of the following three types. And I'd like you to think about these as I go through them. First, a trained craftsman, such as a printer, shopkeeper, accountant, bookkeeper, farmer, whaler, mariner, seagoing trader, etc. Secondly, a professional educated at a college such as a doctor, a lawyer, teacher, judges and magistrates, or politicians in general. And lastly, become skilled in such a way these individuals can make a living and accumulate some level of wealth. A variety of entrepreneurial enterprises can be established as the result of informal training and personal desire, intelligent or possession of an excellent eye-hand coordination. These skills were used for good or evil. A few examples included prostitution, local justice, and this would include lawmen, local sheriffs and policemen, military enlistment, female skilled tradesmen, and I'd like you to think also about female children of tradesmen. Fathers learn their trades such as blacksmithing or tailoring informally. Traditionally, boys were apprenticed for trade occupations, not girls. And lastly, other categories include men or women hired as guns and or men or women as vigilantes. These three family types would earn a living in the West or would perish. This family type had a keen eye on the economy. 
knew how to fit in and was resilient in their goals to succeed. They adapted to the ever-changing economic climate as it became necessary. Examples here could be the decision to return to school to earn another degree, uh, perhaps to take in a partner in one's business, or to acquire low-cost land that was in their area that was now reasonable. And so to purchase this land would be a good decision. Typically in this family type, the father worked middle management or was an educated professional. For this family type, the wife was expected to cultivate the ideal domestic sense of tranquility in a home environment that was tastefully decorated, exhibiting the family's material wealth thus representing their status in the community. And now on to two prominent subcultures of the American West. These were the Yankees and the Hoosiers. Transplanted Yankees arrived and settled western regions from New England and the states surrounding. Typically, they were of British-American colonial stock, or perhaps they were recent immigrants from Northern Europe, having lived a generation or so in New England. Hoosiers, on the other hand, came from a later colonial, early Republican frontier culture, from in, around, or within the Indiana area. Hoosiers were heavily armed and possessed short tempers. Kin networks and alliances were important features of daily life in the West. Hoosier frontier culture was different in form and practice from New Englanders. Life in the upper Northeast was often met with long winters and a short growing season. Time, it seems, was always short. Not enough time in a day to complete tasks when needing done. In addition, idleness and time wasted was considered a sin. Thus, New Englanders as a culture became a most industrious frontier population. Some of their agricultural pursuits included the growing of hay, fruit orchard tending, dairy-oriented activities along with cheese production while cultivating large vegetable gardens. Yankees made excellent entrepreneurs and poverty among this culture was quite low across time as compared with other American groups. They were often literate and avid churchgoers Hard work resulted in economic profits. Yankees enjoyed meals of roasted chicken, cheese and berries, bacon, and apple tarts. Vegetable dishes along with baked breads and pies. On the other hand, Hoosiers, because of their frontier settlements lacking religious unity, and they did not mandate the control of moral behavior like in New England, they lacked any sense that leisure was not sinful. Hoosiers gained a reputation for easy lifestyles gained from little effort. Poverty, inadequate diets, and disease frequented frontier families of this particular American culture. As whiskey production was a frontier commodity that supplemented farming, excessive drinking of spirits was common. For Hoosiers, their meal would be a simple affair consisting of pan-fried cornbread with a stew-like concoction. Other groups pushing out west after arriving in America as recent immigrants to New York City 
were Swedish settlers. Swedes migrated to Minnesota, preferring to plant barley, wheat, and oats. Russian and German settlers migrated to Nebraska, planting grains and rearing some farm animals. Alcohol production was common. Welcome back. From the 1850s to the 1920s, life in the Western United States was heavy on violence. A philosophy emerged in the West to which settlers quickly adapted and incorporated into their lives. And it's here I talk about these five conditions that settlers would use and incorporate violence into their lives under certain conditions. Number one, homestead ethic. Number two, justifiable dueling. Number three, western trappings. Number four, livelihood right. And number five, the use of vigilantes. All right, the first one is tied to issues of property. Homestead ethic, the right to stand one's ground and entitled to use deadly force if necessary by confronting bandits and Indians when threatened and when it seemed that there was no other way out. The frontiersman claimed the right to kill to protect his or her own property and kin. All right, the next principle, uh, which has two parts to it, is tied to honor and reputation issues. So, justifiable dueling. Personal disagreements, such as slander and insults, could be resolved in the use of dueling. The one left standing was considered right and truthful. The next principle is Western trappings. These were symbols of authority and power. Settlers wore on a daily basis firearms or had a rifle sleeved onto their saddles as a part of the riding habit. Settlers of the West are historically the most heavily armed populations in the world. A man or woman could use a gun well. This individual would be praised for their willingness to put their life on the line. All right, the following two, and these are my last uh, principles, uh, they are tied to uh, economic and what I called legal shortcomings. The first is the livelihood right. Property owners condoned violence if their livelihoods were perceived as threatened. Rich or up-and-coming, these men on the make were ready to resort to violence, usually by hiring someone to do the dirty work, to defend their land or access to water rights. And then my final category here, uh, still under economic and legal shortcomings, has to do with the use of vigilantes to settle differences when there was no other solution. Settlers or towns took the law into their own hands to either set a wrong right, which some have called frontier justice, or to fund a paid killer to eliminate a threat. There was a healthy market for a hired killer, especially by wealthy men that wanted so-and-so politician put out of the way. When storekeepers formed an alliance to keep the peace in their small towns, curbing disorder and violence when cowboys herding cattle came in, they were known to employ skilled gunfighters to keep cowboys in line. Whether arresting drunken and destructive cowboys or to kill them outright. 
By the eve of World War I, the West produced the majority of the nation's copper, gold, and silver. Copper was so vital to creating electrical, telegraph, and in time, telephone industries that after the 1880s, mining copper became a very lucrative endeavor. Copper in the West first appeared in Montana and then in Arizona by the 1910s. In time, Utah, Nevada, and New Mexico joined the list. But mining copper was costly. It required a significant amount of capital to mine, smelt, this means uh, refining it, and of course to market this product. In time, three large corporations emerged that would pursue copper mining to include Anaconda in Montana. This would be backed by Rockefeller family money. Kinnicott in Utah and Alaska. This is Guggenheim money. And Phelps Dodge in Arizona. By 1940, these three corporations dominated the U.S. copper market output in the West, some say by 80%. By 1901, it was understood by many that additional sources of fuel needed to be found and made available to Americans. Coal was not the long-term solution. Oil refined into gasoline and lubricating oils became the future. Oil was tapped in Texas and California, becoming a booming industry by the 1890s. Corporate giants emerged such as Union Oil of California and Standard Oil of California, known today as Chevron. Between 1901 and 1940, California ranked among the first in oil-producing states for 14 years running. Oil refining became the state's manufacturing commodity. Outside of California, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, and Montana joined in this industry while Texas stole the boom in oil production during the Great Depression, replacing California in 1931 as a top producer. Labor in the West was diverse. There were mountain men and miners, mariners and dock workers, merchants and traders. Farmers and cattle barons, and a professional class that would include some women, such as doctors, and then of course teachers. They came west for different reasons and varied in their family style. By 1900, city centers such as Denver, Seattle, and El Paso formed a type of urban outpost as compared with little towns across the plains and the western frontier in general. Areas, of course, were separated sometimes by vast deserts. San Francisco from Salt Lake, Los Angeles from Denver. These deserts were hundreds of miles across in places. Forests and mountains, too, stood as significant barriers between urban centers while most of the state of California was constantly short of water. Advances in technology helped to win the West, in which a new kind of city emerged. It differed from the cities created in the colonial era. Western cities and her residents wanted the home, these public and private comforts found in established cities in the East. So this was the curb appeal that they wanted out West. This encouraged Western cities to become attractive for Easterners 
in which they would bring west their businesses. And they would do this by, in the west, building schools, wharfs, and warehouses, commercial centers, public libraries, fire hydrants, and beautiful homes. They would lay streets, telegraph, and later telephone lines, electric lights, water lines, and systems, along with making cities cleaner with sewer and their enhancements. What helped the establishment of Western cities was geographical access to it. Railroads, steamship lines, and roads interconnected the West over time. Not only for traveler migration, but also for commercial reasons. Transportation networks connected rural farms with commercial centers of trades in city. These cities were, of course, large and small. Western cities typically differed and had underlying factors for their creation. Founded 11 years after Salt Lake City from the early days of the 1870s, Denver existed as a center to outfit miners. The typical Denver migrant was single and male, to which, as you might expect, the town became a wild environment with gold-laden miners looking for a good time with prostitutes, whiskey, gambling, and the mayhem that would result. Drunkenness and rioting brought in a police force while vigilante activities raged for years. San Francisco was the 19th century city of the West. It had low density suburbs, cultural centers to include libraries, an opera house, and theaters for plays. It existed as a healthy trading commercial center. It was Boston-like as a city type of which this environment was not easily found or matched out west. While San Francisco was perhaps atypical as a western city, it contained its share of segregated neighborhoods. This would be Chinese, Black, Mexican, and Indian. It also contained slums, brothels, and saloons. Before gold was found and California became a republic mid-century, San Francisco only had 800 residents. By 1900, it had reached 300,000 in population. Yes, San Francisco rose rapidly. Three-fourths of the residents of the 1850s were now replaced with migrants and immigrants from abroad. These were typically moneyed Easterners, but also included gold miners. The demand and acquisition of white-collar workers, such as middle-class management and men with good math skills and accounting, increased to about 40% between 1870 and 1900. All the while, San Francisco's reliance on unskilled workers was reduced by more than 50% during the same period. This occupational shift by the turn of the century was a part of a broader pattern in America. As the country became more industrial, an educated class was needed, and being white made some Americans more suitable for jobs than others. Now we move on to a disappearing West. By the 1880s, forest preserves had been established. 
Surprisingly, it was not a Western idea, but began in upstate New York. It responded to fears of deforestation and became a model to conservation efforts further west. Federal conservation of forests filtered down to hunting and fishing rights. At the turn of the century, politicians acknowledged new environmental problems. In response, they created new laws to address these issues. To protect migrating birds and the reproductive cycles of some animals, the U.S. Congress created the Migratory Bird Act of 1913, followed by the Migratory Bird Treaty with Canada in 1916. Not surprising, local communities argued over traditional times to hunt and where to hunt. As custom, free and unrestricted hunting practices since frontier times had been established. And along with this, we have to consider fish and game regulation. This occurred under earlier programs as well. In 1905, the new Bureau of Biological Survey focused on collecting research to identify the impact of wild animals on agricultural crops. Starting in 1915, this committee established a systematic campaign to destroy predators and other creatures considered vermin to include the following. Coyotes, grizzly bears, mountain lions, and wolves in efforts to protect domesticated cattle and other animals. By targeting the wholesale destruction of predatory animals, this had another effect. It made more deer, elk, and moose highly prized by hunters, and these became more available. To oversee the future of fish, the Bureau of Fisheries that was established in 1903 identified species and their populations along with spawning times and promoted legislation on how they could be best protected in regards to overfishing. Separate agencies supervised Alaskan fishing and fur seal resources. At the same time, the United States joined Canada, Russia, and Japan in seeking to stop the extinction of Alaskan and Siberian seals, leading to the Fur Seal Treaty of 1911, which banned open sea seal hunting. My final topic for this lecture reading is a romanticized West remembered. Western art illustrates a story commonly remembered by a regional population. This central character is typically male, while challenges to his way of life were competitive rivals and the environment. Western art confirmed the American spirit in the West, self-sacrificing and pioneering. Western art told cautionary tales about graft and greed, about race and adversity, as well as progress. There seemed to be sacrifices while men made merry over a campfire and civilization seemed to be out of reach in this Western wilderness of years gone by. As a new genre, artists created a version of the history of the West, a memory not to be forgotten, a romantic view of a West that has disappeared long ago. Even the word Western implies a wild existence set against seemingly insurmountable odds. 
Through legend parlayed as historical fiction, Hollywood filmmakers produce romantic views of a historical past while holding on to the myth and contributing to it. This tradition remains appealing to moviegoers today. The popular legends shown in film could be good history, while the main characters were either real or imagined to help tell the story better, as any historian will admit. A few average people wrote about their lives, and without these primary sources, these histories would remain unwritten. Legend in storytelling is the bridge between what history is and what is not or could not be written down. Modern moviegoers seem to accept Westerns on their face value. For an international audience, this place known as the West became larger in life, in books, film, and art. Paintings and sculptures from the 1890s illustrated battles and heroes down to their essential elements. It is obvious Western culture was inspired from the ancient Roman and Greek periods. It is an art form celebrating the American West in terms they can understand. Strong male bodies, conquest, honor, loyalty, and struggle. Common plot lines of life in the Old West included vigilantes. These, of course, are the bandit bad guys. Or hired guns for good and cattle barons along with whites who had gone missing. The Marlboro Man cigarette campaign was established in 1954. The, gal the cowboy himself, as a hero, comes under the male escapist fantasy. The Western as film connects commonly held ideals. Oftentimes, the U.S. cavalry situated in a desert-like wasteland arrives at the last minute to save wagon train migrants or to rescue an Anglo-American child from Indian capture. Meanwhile, the rugged, roguelike male main character, strong and independent, drives the story. Think of John Wayne in The Searchers and you will be spot on. This Western film character does not give up, is successful most of the time against the bad guys. He has its faults, possesses experience and excellent common sense. Typically handsome in a rugged kind of way, is a man of few words, and reliably a good shot when necessary. This man would be the one to rely on to keep life as it was, unlike relying on the government or local law enforcement to keep the peace. While these characterizations are played out in Hollywood films as fiction, this is how the West has been oftentimes remembered. All the while, elements of truth and experience circulate and are shared in our collective memories passed down from generation to generation. Well, this brings to an end another lecture reading, and I would like to thank you again for your time and attention. <clears throat>